Well, my name is Sylvia Jobling, Sylvia Violet Elizabeth Jobling. Um, I'm 83, but I'm 80, I'm nearly 84 in July. Um, and I came to Winchester because I met my second husband and he lived in Winchester. So I moved to a house that was adjacent to his, not actually in it. It took him some time to persuade me to jump over. <laughs> but that's how I came about 40 years ago. But I lived just outside Winchester before that. Well, my life as a child was in London. Um, I was uh, five years old when the war started and I lived in northwest London in a council maisonette with my mother and father and my sister. And then my father was called up, as all men were, at, in 1942. And uh, so we were left, all the, all the women, and there was Mrs Duffy next door with her children, Mrs Williams with her children next door, Mrs Erickson upstairs with her children, and there was Mum with my sister Linda and I downstairs. So it was during the war, we weren't evacuated, um, and... I suppose it was a time of uh, poverty, first of all, not a lot of food, uh, but everyone was in the same boat, so it, it didn't seem to bother us as children. My mother was, my auntie said she was sixpence short of a shilling, she wasn't very bright, but she was very lovely and a good plain cook. She worked in a canteen in a factory and all the women worked and the children went off to school and came home from school and our mums weren't there. So, you know, today I suppose you'd call us latchkey kids, but we came home and I was quite young. I looked after my younger sister um, and I think I was quite responsible. My father and mother met, she'd had, uh, she'd met someone at South End on Sea um, when she was on holiday with her friend Daisy and this guy had kicked a beach ball and uh, he'd apologised and then they got talking so she started to go out with him but she found out that he was married so uh, my, her parents took her to the British Working Men's Club um, and in walked my dad, and he was young, he was five years younger than my mum. Her name was May, and his name was Harry, but they called him Ron, I don't know why. And uh, she said to me, Koch, he looked like Rudolf Valentino, and he danced like Fred Astaire, and she fell in love with him. And I somehow think he wasn't quite as in love with her, her as she was with him but one night she and her sister Florrie had come in late at half past ten and her father had given her a belt and I think she was about 25 when that happened and she was telling my dad and he said oh you'll have to you'll have to marry me but I don't think he really meant it but she said oh yes so they decided to get married and they got married on Christmas Eve and all, she said, all we had was a roll of lino. So they had the Christmas meal in the evening was combined with their uh, wedding breakfast. And then they, they went to bed. Uh, but my mother was really, really shy. And uh, so when they got onto the bed, the bed collapsed. And everybody was cheering in the garden. So they'd undone the bolts on the bed and she'd fallen, they'd fallen onto the floor. Um, oh, I was going to tell you something that was rude. No, <laughs> sorry, I won't do that. <laughs> well, well, she's, my mother always said, you know, I had my little friend on my wedding night and I was too I didn't want to tell dad so I kept my vest on 
under my nightdress so to sort of give him her hint <laughs> but uh, I always surmise that uh, at least they got together twice because my sister and I were, were born but she was a very innocent sort of woman. They lived in one room in my grandma's little house in Borthwick Road and uh, so they lived in one room with my sister and I and they smoked, they both smoked, my father smoked all his life and it was the smoking that carried him off in the end. So I think my sister and I, I have asthma quite badly, so I think, I often think that perhaps these two tiny babies, uh, because my sister, my mother was cleaning plate glass windows when she went into labour, she, she, you know, she worked in some shops doing cleaning and when my sister was born, she was only four pound. So we, these tiny babies in this room, and then my father got pneumonia and uh, they wouldn't let him out of hospital until we had a home. And there were so many jobs, it was very difficult to decide which one you wanted. There, there were plenty of jobs. And I went to an accountant in London and because I'd been doing some of that sort of more difficult accountancy work. Um, but then there was a job in a cosmetic um, salon. For, it was Helena Rubenstein's. So they said, well, we don't think you'll get the job because they won't want someone with cosmetic industry. Um, experience but I went and I did get the job in this just wonderful uh, salon at number three Grafton Street and you went in the door and the smells of the perfume and the white curtains blowing in the breeze and lovely marble staircases and uh, uh, somebody came down and they gave me the test and I got the job and that, I was there for five years working for Helena Rubenstein. I worked for Mrs. Griver, who was the, um, she ran all the beauty classes and, the, and she looked after the reps. And we went out and gave lectures in stores uh, to women. And um, it was a wonderful five years. I'd, I'd met my first husband then. And I was, we got married and I was pregnant and he had an offer, he was in television, so he had an offer to come down to um, Hampshire, to Southampton, to work at Southern Television, which was just starting up. And so we came down here um, into Southampton. So that was the start of... That was a hard, that was a very hard time because I earned a lot of money. I earned as much money as he did, but there was no question of, you know, do you want to move? You, you went, you followed your husband down and uh, I didn't, um, I didn't work for a little while. I had, you know, I was having a baby and uh, you have to make new friends, but he, it, he was fated as though he was a film star. Uh, it's difficult to imagine that now, but in 1958, you know, where they went all they went all around the south coast advertising Southern Television, and they were partying, and I was in this horrible flat all on my own with no television, nothing like that, and uh, it was a very very lonely time. When I uh, be, was divorced, my husband, uh, I don't think there's one member of the camera crew that is still with his wife. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, we, the marriage uh, ended, sadly. Um, Jeffrey and I didn't end because although he went with, off with someone else, we've, you know, my children, it was very important that my children had their father in their lives. So... Uh, we had an amicable uh, divorce, if you can ever have one of those. And once I'd got over the shock, and I 
It was a shock. I was six stone. My hair fell out. I, it was a terrible shock. If you think someone is travelling on the same road as you, and then you find out that, that it isn't like that at all. Um, and all, you know, all you've ever wanted, really, it seems, is your, you know, is to have a happy family life, whatever that is, and for your children to have two parents. So I was determined that their father would not disappear from their lives, even though he said to me, I don't think I should come and see the children again. It'll be too upsetting for them. And I said, no, 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 it's going to be upsetting for you and you have to come back because you're not dead. And then I changed my job and because I had to bring up my children and pay the mortgage. And um, I became a Samaritan. So I was a, a Samaritan for a few years. And then they sent me to uh, Southampton University. I went on a one day a week course for about a year. And it, that was all attitudes to human sexuality. So I, at the Samaritans, I could, um, if anyone was having a difficult call, I could listen in and then I could talk afterwards with, uh, with the person concerned. And then I, someone said, oh, you should be a marriage guidance counsellor. So I said, oh, well, I'm divorced. So I, anyway, I, I applied and I went and you have quite a, a stringent, um, for, uh, for three or four days, you're away. And so I was accepted. I became a marriage guidance counsellor. And then I'd met my second husband and he was a podiatrist. So gradually I started to work in his surgery and I trained, you know, to be his dirty nurse because he did surgery as well. His mother got Alzheimer's and my mother had dementia. So I gave up, I had to give up marriage guidance. I gave up those jobs because if you're a marriage, whatever you're doing, and you make a commitment to someone, you've got to do that. You you can't keep saying, oh, well, I, I can't see you next week because I've got to go up. I felt that I had to, I had to give up those things that I really enjoyed doing to look after uh, my mother-in-law who was in Lincoln and my mother was in London. My, my husband, Hugh, sadly uh, died uh, 10 years ago with, uh, very suddenly with a lung cancer, not, not from smoking. And then uh, about two years after that, my first husband also died from lung cancer, but that was from smoking. So I helped my children um, look after him. And his, his wife had died with Alzheimer's. So I'd also helped my children, you know, I cooked for them and I cooked, you know, helped them with Maggie. And then when I came to the singing group, uh, I met Helen and I sat next to her and I started to talk to her on my very first day. But she, when she answered me, she smiled. She had the most beautiful, beautiful smile. And uh, But she had Alzheimer's, so her speech... Uh, was very uh, dysfunctional. She couldn't string a sentence together. And I really, I thought, oh, but I budded up to her. She became a friend and I took her to the toilet. And then I met Harry because people come with their partner. So then I met Harry and I met Norman. And these two gentlemen just love singing and they love all the old songs, you know, all the Frank Sinatra songs. So we used to go out as a foursome and have meals together and uh, we've been to the cinema when, and Helen could manage to come. And then Helen got worse and worse, so sadly she had to go into care. So Norman, we all continued and we used to have little sing-songs up at the house and up at uh, Harry's house. And then Helen was sent to Flower Down 
and it was an end of life situation which went on for quite a long time. So I used to go with Harry um, up there and support him and go up with him two or three times a week. He went up nearly every day. Um, and then ha Helen died at the end of July. And so our friendship has continued. Um, he, he's 91 this year, so it's a night. <laughs> so it's not, uh, it's not a Romeo and Juliet situation, but it's just a close friendship of two old people sort of trying to give each other company. So we go to the cinema a lot, we go to the theatre, and uh, we have meals. There's, there's always the capacity to love. I was very surprised when I, I saw a headline about Jane Fonda saying, I've shut it all up down below. <laughs> but I, I perhaps agree with that. But, you know, there's always, there's always um, a possibility of love. I think it would be so sad if you didn't think that you could find someone to love. And it's not the same love all through your life. I know when I met my first husband, that was forever. And I stood in the church and I said, forever, I will love him forever. And I never thought that I could ever love anyone again. Um, and then we were divorced and it was, it, it was wonderful to fall in love with someone else. But I thought, no, I, it, you know, you only love because we're all we're all told, aren't we, that there's only one, you know, prince on a horse for you. And I guess because my first husband was the first person I'd ever kissed, so it was quite uh, hard. But um, no, I think love is wonderful. You should always, and not just between, not I don't mean sexual love, and I don't mean love between a man and a woman. Because you've, it's the capacity. I have a, a I have a, a female friend who comes to singing Lynn, and I love her. 